Hey everybody, this video is gonna be a little bit different, but I'm hoping that it's going to be helpful and informative for you because today we're talking about remote recording sessions. Uh, kind of what they are, how they work, what they look like, and um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the gear that I use for my own remote recording sessions. So right off the bat, this video is broken up into a few different sections. And you can go down to the timeline and see what those sections are and skip around. Uh, you know, if you're someone who says, I don't want to hear you talk, just get to the guitar playing, uh, you can go down right now and just skip to the guitar playing portion of this. But I do want to say that I set this video up in a way that I hope to give you as much information as I can to help get you started with remote recording sessions. Or if remote recording sessions are already something you're very familiar with, to maybe um, help you think of some things that you might not have otherwise thought about on the business side of things. So, like I said, this video is broken up into different sections. The first section is what you're watching right now, the introduction. And uh, the second section is me actually sitting down with a remote recording session that I got hired for and playing through it. You know, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna work out, you know, rhythm sections and lead stuff and and uh, I'm gonna talk through why I'm doing certain things, but uh, that's the playing section. The third section is me going through a list of things that I hope are gonna help you get started with remote session work if you uh, are completely new to it, or just some things for you to think about if you're already doing sessions to make your life easier, um, and just kind of explaining remote recording sessions uh, on a, from a business uh, approach, from like a professionalism approach. The fourth thing, the fourth section, is gear talk. I'm actually gonna show you guys what I use to record the sounds that I get. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit why I use what I use, but um, that section I'm hoping is gonna be helpful mainly for the guitar players. I'm gonna be talking largely about how I get the sounds that I get in a less than um, optimum room. Uh, you know, I, this recording space that I have is just a spare room in my townhouse. And I get some pretty good sounds out of it that go on, you know, some pretty great recordings. So I wanted to share that part with you guys as well. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into the first substantive section of the video here. Like I said, this section is going to be me actually playing through a remote session that I got hired to play on. Um, it's a song that's part of a larger album project that I'm working with, uh, with the group with. Uh, the group is called The Waymores. Um, they started it here in Georgia. They are a band that travels all over the country and they are signed to a label out of uh, Austin, Texas called uh, Chicken Ranch. Now, I've been hired to play on um, their solo projects before. It's a, they're, they're a singer-songwriter country duo. I've played on their individual solo projects as well as a previous album project for them. Um, so I am getting a little bit of a head start here with regard to knowing what they like, you know, guitar tones and sort of the tracks and how to approach them. But I have not heard this song yet. I purposely saved it for this video. So we're going to listen to it together. Um, I do want to make a note right up front here about the guitar signal. Um, I've got the guitar running into a Focusrite ISA-1 um, plug DI, and uh, the output of that is going into the pedal board over here, which is going into the amp. I've got the speaker out of the amp going into um, this Two Notes Captor X uh, load box, which is running a line level signal, of course, into the Focusrite 18i8 interface. I'm running Cubase and uh, for the um, signal that's coming out of the Two Notes Captor X, I'm running uh, the Two Notes Wall of Sound um, IR plugin for the speaker. And uh, that should cover it. The amp is a Vintage Sound V15, which is basically like a really nice um, 15 watt Princeton. So. Um, with that, let's uh, let's go ahead and just listen to the song, and there's probably going to be more to discuss after that.
sounds like it's an A. Splitting solos with uh, with a pedal steel, so probably only doing the first half of that. Um, there's a lot to, to, to really work with there. Um, they leave some space here and there for some guitar stuff, of course. Uh, one thing that I mentioned while that was playing, um, they already told me that I'm splitting solos with the pedal steel, uh, so I think I'm only doing the first half of that solo section. Um, the producer engineer uh, on this project is a pedal steel player, so when we get to the fills, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, they asked me to do a train beat on this. Uh, this is a super straightforward pattern uh, or you know chord pattern here. So uh, we can go ahead and just knock out that train beat real quick. I am hearing uh, a little bit of a different rhythm that could be cool, um, but we'll do the train beat first and then maybe come back and track like an alternate to give them. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do this. Okay, um, that was okay. Uh, there were a couple spots where I, I was a little off tempo. I'll probably go back and 
do a couple more takes of that, but you guys don't need to watch me record rhythm guitar parts over and over. But that was, um, that was the rhythm part there uh, that they asked for, the tic-tac the tic -tac there. Um, let's, I'm gonna go ahead and what we're gonna do here is actually, we're gonna do a second rhythm part. Like I said, I'm hearing something a little bit different. Um, now, for those of you who are thumb style players like me, this is a cool thing that kind of tracks really well with, um, with a train beat. So uh, I'm gonna do a run through on this and kind of see how it goes. But I think what'll be cool is, you know, to just send them both, see which one they decide to use. Uh, again, you know, if you guys are, are interested in going down and actually finding the, the actual track and just seeing which one they chose, that could be fun. couple mistakes in there um, but again I'll go back later and kind of clean those up and just sort of get them right but uh, yeah you know I, I when sometimes when you hear an alternate rhythm part like that it can be cool to just sort of hop in and do something um, and you know kind of send everybody some alternates you don't want to go overboard with it you don't want to send them five six seven different options but if you hear something and you know you sort of know them, and you know that they kind of give you a little bit of creative license. It's okay to send an alternate. Um, they could very well just dump it, and that's totally fine. So we're gonna kind of focus on the solo section here for a minute, and uh, and see what we can come up with. Again, I haven't listened to this. I haven't worked on anything, so there's probably going to be some back and forth here, and um, let's just see how it goes. Nope, I can say right off the bat that's not going to be good. Um, they asked for something, uh, probably worth mentioning, they asked for something um, fast chicken picking. They actually use the word chicken picking. Um, that's not fast. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is not something that I would normally choose to play on this. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily go like super fast chicken picking on this, but let's just sort of, let's, let's try it. It's not 
I'm not feeling that. Um, all right, we'll keep going. Uh, it's it's not not <laughs> Something like that could work. So yeah, something. Um, I'm gonna just. I'm gonna just. I'm gonna take that again. Uh, it's it's not not hmm. It's getting there. Uh, it's it's not not Okay, that was kind of sloppy, but I think that's all we're playing over right there. Um, so we're gonna do that again. It's not okay, uh, it's getting there, it's getting there. It's not Okay, um, so a couple things. One, I'm not gonna make you guys sit through any more takes. You kind of get the idea. We're getting close. Um, I'll be surprised um, to see whether or not this or something I do later makes it onto the final version. Again, I wouldn't necessarily play this, but I know that this is what they're looking for and this is what they're asking for. So, um, you know, what they want, it's, it's their project. And I don't think it sounds bad, it's just not normally what I would do right here. So let's kind of move forward and work on fills. Uh, now the thing about the fills uh, for this is I tend to do for this particular engineer um, and this particular project, uh, I tend to do two different like full through fill tracks. And um, so that's just basically me playing through guitar licks and everything. That way they have a bunch of stuff to choose from later on when they're doing uh, the final mix. Now, a couple things. One, even though I'm gonna play through all of this, there's again a pedal steel guitar that's most likely gonna be splitting licks and all of that with me. So most of this is probably not going anywhere near the final take. But, um, you know, again, just knowing how they work, they like to have these options. And um, here we go. I don't miss none of my friends that left me high and dry back then. If you're sitting home just to wonder in. So you guys get the idea on this. I'm not going to make you sit through like two full tracks of fills, but um, yeah, once you complete everything, um, it all winds up getting bounced and um, you know, it looks something like this. Uh, again, I'm probably going to go back through after this video and do some cleaning up and, and all of that. A couple things that I want to remind people of here with this is um, you really need to set your pride aside when you're doing session work because it's all about at the end of the day The final product that you're sending to the client, right? So you guys saw I did uh, a few takes on the guitar solo um, It's okay. Um, it's okay to do enough takes to get it right So, you know, I, I know that I didn't get that as clean as I could so I'm gonna go through and just kind of do a few more of those but um I hope this section of the video was helpful for you guys. 
I know that it's not the most exciting thing to watch someone else record, and if it's something that you're already used to, you probably already skipped it at this point. But I hope that you found this interesting if you're still watching. I hope that you found it helpful. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions in the comment section about anything that I did. And um, with that, uh, thank you all so much. All right, I hope that last section was interesting or entertaining or that you got something out of it. This section, I'm gonna be doing a lot more talking. Uh, this section is primarily me going over things that I've learned over the years doing remote work and um, you know traditional session work and uh, giving you some tips to help get you started or to get you thinking about certain things when, when you um, start doing this yourself. I'm gonna put up a list right here of the main topics that I'm gonna discuss in this section. That way you can look at it and just know whether or not you wanna stick around for this section. Uh, you know, if this is information that you're just not interested in, I totally understand, go ahead and just skip it. All right, let's get started by talking about getting started, specifically getting started with remote work. For me, I got started with the remote session work as a byproduct of the fact that I was doing traditional uh, sessions already around the Atlanta area. So I was you know, going to other people's studios and recording guitar. I'm assuming that's not most of you. For, for, for those people who are coming to this cold who want to get into doing remote session work, there's a couple things that I want you to think about. First, you have to think about who your customer is. You know, a lot of times we socialize with other, you know, like people. So guitar players on guitar forums talking about guitars. That's not really who you're going to be working with if you're trying to do remote session work. You've got really two primary categories, or at least this is what I've found to be true. Producers and engineers, and then songwriters and creators. And for both of those categories of, of people, there are places that you can go to, both physically and digitally, in order to sort of put yourself out there. Physically, you know, go to local songwriters nights and introduce yourself and explain what you do. You know, same way that you would network if you're trying to start a band. You know, you have to go to the places that they already are. Same thing applies for, you know, the digital world. Find people's social medias uh, or social media accounts. You know, if it's an, if it's an engineer you really want to work with, they're probably on Instagram, send them a message professionally, not in a harassing way, not in like a hey bro kind of way, you know, uh, have it put together professionally, have someone else read your message before you send it, um, you know, and then start kind of also thinking about these groups that it might not be a way to make money, but it might be a way to get good practice. You know, these are like subreddits and Facebook groups and, you know, Instagram, um, you know, uh, collab, things where you can meet other people who are just looking to create product or, or looking to create music online. And uh, that's a good way to get your feet wet. Now I wanna say one thing about you know websites like Fiverr. Websites like Fiverr um, or other contractor type websites, they can be good. Um, you know, I've gotten a few jobs from, from Fiverr specifically, but you have to remember that those spaces are already um, oversaturated with pretty much every type of creator, including musicians. So, you know, if you create a, an account on Fiverr and you start putting yourself out there, don't expect it to get a ton of traction because you're basically at that point just promoting your Fiverr account the same way that you would just be promoting yourself otherwise. So moving on to the next part of this discussion, you got the gig. Someone wants you to record for them. Uh, what should you talk about right up front? Uh, the first thing that you should talk about is how they're actually going to get their files to you and how you're going to get your files back to them. Uh, file sharing platforms are going to be your best friend for this. You know, uh, things like Dropbox, Google Drive, um, and have the accounts on the big ones ready to go because while they might have a preferred method you know they might say hey i'm going to send everything to you on dropbox they may very well just ask you what works for you and if you can just send them a google drive link and say just drop everything in this folder and we're good to go you're going to look more professional the next thing that you're going to want to talk about in that same conversation is when they do send you files you should be asking for their project parameters. So, you know, the bit rate, sample rate, um, a click track, 
ask for the things that you can then use to set your project up in the same way that theirs is set up. You know, you don't have to be on the same platform. You don't have to be, you know, Cubase to Cubase or Pro Tools to Pro Tools, but you do want to match their parameters so that when, you know, you're sending files back and forth, it's just literally a drag and drop function and there's no sort of weirdness um, between the two, um, you know, projects. The next thing to think about or to talk about right up front is um, reference tracks, charts, and song maps. So on the last um, section of this video, you probably saw that I didn't have a chart, I didn't have a song map, um, and I didn't really talk about reference tracks. And that's because for that, um, it was a song that you could pretty easily figure out by ear. We already had a conversation about the pedal steel and where it was gonna go, so I didn't need a song map. And I I've worked with them before and they already kind of gave me the you know, chicken picking and they wanted Tic Tac. So I already kind of had an idea of what they were looking for, but on a lot of, uh, a lot of projects, you're not gonna have that. Um, if, it might be a song that's more complicated in terms of the arrangement. It might be a song that is gonna have a lot of instrumentation that's not there yet. So it's okay to ask for these things. Um, you know, I know a lot of times we go, oh, you know what, it's gonna make me look bad if I don't, if I can't figure this out by ear. But if you have to take days or hours out of your time in order to figure something out, that's really just time off of their timeline and that's time out of your life that you're not gonna get back that a simple conversation could fix, especially reference tracks. You know, if you're spending hours sending things back and forth, just guessing what they want, that's not gonna make you look very good and it's gonna become frustrating very fast. So if they have something that they say, you know, I really like the guitar part on this, I would like it to be, you know, similar on my song. That's going to, you know, cut 50% of the BS out right up front. All right, so continuing on with the conversations that you should probably be having right up front, let's pause for a second and talk about the importance of communication with remote session work. Now, communication with music is is generally almost always important, but it's especially important with the remote nature of what we're talking about here because you are in a space by yourself trying to figure out what someone else wants who's not there with you. So figuring out what they want through discussion, being upfront about what you are able to do and what you need in order to be successful, it's, it's incredibly important and it always makes you look more professional so long as you present it in a professional way. Now, let's talk about some other conversations that you should have um, right up front to make yourself look more professional and to just be you know, very transparent with what you're doing. This is stuff like your timeline or their timeline. You know, if, if they have a deadline, like a lot of recording projects do, it's important for you to know that so that you're not running over their deadline um, simply because you didn't have that conversation and they neglected to tell you. So figuring out when they need the product by and figuring out if that fits into your schedule or if you need to have a conversation about whether you can do the project that's very important. The other thing to think about, the other thing to discuss with this right up front is your fee. You know, if you're doing this professionally, you don't want someone to have sticker shock at the end because you didn't have that conversation. Because part of doing this uh, in a remote sense or doing session work in general is getting more work through word of mouth. And if they never want to work with you again because you scared them with the price at the back end or you surprised them, or you know, maybe they just didn't have realistic expectations, you know, all of that can be resolved by just talking to them right up front about what it is that you expect to be paid. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what you actually charge. Let's talk about um, actually getting paid. And let's start that conversation by talking about fee structures. There's two main ones. You've got hourly and then you've got fixed or flat rate. I very much prefer the latter, uh, and I, I do for two primary reasons. Um, hourly rates, it actually can turn into a negative the better you get. The more efficient you become, the faster you get at getting you know, a product to a client, it, it can actually wind up making you a lot less money because you've gotten better at it. The second thing is even if you're uh, charging a lot less money, it, hourly rates invite more scrutiny. So people, you know, since they're not there with you, they don't really know how much time you spent working on a project. 
and you know you just don't want to you want to avoid those conversations if you can even if it's saving them money at the end so I prefer going with a uh, flat or fixed fee um, and that way I'm not basing my value on my time but I'm rather basing my value on the product that I'm providing now I like to point to uh, the Nashville Musicians Union website I like to direct uh, potential customers there and just basically say hey go look at that that's how much they charge and either I charge the same thing I charge more or I charge less and I can deviate from that um, from what the union charges based on what I think my value is to the project or based on what the project calls for so you know it's not really this is what I always charge but rather this is a baseline and I can charge more or less than that depending on the variables of the project. So let's talk about the second part of that conversation, actually getting paid. Uh, now I prefer to get the payment up front or at least a portion of the payment up front that may or may not be possible depending on the project and depending on the situation but what you do want to have ready to go right from the beginning is your payment method same thing as the file transfer if you're able to send someone an invoice if you're able to send them like a PayPal invoice or Zelle or you know Venmo whatever it is and say hey this is my preferred method of payment that always makes you look better than on the back end of everything saying oh well however you want to pay me whenever you get around to it that's fine with me don't put the ball in their court um, you're gonna look more professional and you're probably gonna get paid faster uh, if you have your stuff on your end ready to go now let's also have a discussion about what you're sending people when and why um, you know, if you send them all of the master files without ever having received payment, you kind of just have to hope that you get paid at that point. And a lot of times it's fine because you're working with them, you have a relationship, but you don't want to ever get stiffed on the bill. And there's a few ways that I've found that make that less of a possibility. I'm not going to say it eliminates it, but less of a possibility. That's stuff like, um, you know, don't send your master files. Um, you know, if you're trying to get them to approve parts, uh, you can send like a, a glued together, you know, a, a, an export of, you know, a stereo bus with everything together or sections, you know, parts of things that you want them to approve. Or, you know, I've done this before, pull out your cell phone, take a quick video of the guitar solo and send them a cell phone video of the guitar solo for them to either approve or, you know, give you notes back on. That way, you know, you're not having sent all of your hard work out and you're just waiting six months to get your payment. So sticking with that, I want to talk about some other ways to look professional. The very first thing that needs to be discussed between us when it comes to professionalism is the golden rule of session playing. Um, that is, you have to serve the song, you have to serve the client, you're not serving yourself. What I mean by that is it's not about trying to put every cool guitar lick that you know on a song. Just like the previous section when I said, this is not really what I would put here, but this is what they asked for. You're, at the end of the day, serving someone else's vision. You're, you're working on someone else's either passion project or professional you know, presentation you have to be thinking about what is going to make them or their project be the best that it can be while also serving what they want. Um, now sometimes what you want to put on the song and what they want aligns. Sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, you're working on their project. So the golden rule, serve the song, serve the client, not yourself. Now sticking with professionalism here, you want to also be a good referral. What I mean by that is there's going to be times when the person or the, you know, the customer that you're working with wants an instrument on their project that they might not have a player ready for. You know, maybe they want fiddle, maybe they want you know, a, a drummer and they don't know a drummer who does remote work. Having your network set up with you know, people who you know can get the job done and get it done you know, properly, that's not only going to make you look like a professional to the customer, but it's also a wonderful networking opportunity for you to, you know, if you throw a gig to a fiddle player, maybe they're, they'll throw a gig your way next time they're asked that same question on a project they're working on. So, you know, be a Rolodex um, or have yours ready to go. 
The other thing that I want to reiterate is, again, the importance of communication when it comes to professionalism. You know, you might want to look like a rock star and just do everything on your end and spend a ton of time trying to figure everything out, but you're going to look more professional if you just find out what they want up front. I know I've said that a few times, but it's worth reiterating. So kind of the last part of this discussion, let's talk about the things that you need to know right up front how to do if you want to do remote session work professionally. Now I say professionally because if you're just looking to do online collabs and you know kind of get started, that's totally fine. You can actually probably skip this section. But for those of you who are putting yourselves out there for the purpose of, of making money and doing this in the professional world, um, you need to know first how to play your instrument. I know that might seem obvious, but you need to have a level of proficiency to where you are the expert, where you're the professional that you are being hired to be, whether it's a drummer or a guitar player, you're being hired to be that guy. The second thing that I want to mention is you need to know how to record yourself. Now I know, again, that might seem obvious, but it goes a little deeper than that. You are not just the musician at this point, you are the musician and the engineer. You need to have your workflow together to where you're not spending days getting different sounds. You need to know how your gear works to get to the sound that you're looking for quickly and efficiently. Um, that way you're serving the project and you're not wasting your own time as, as well. You know, part of that is knowing how to achieve the, I'm not gonna say stereotypical, but the standard sounds within a genre because a lot of times the conversations with the client are going to be something like, hey, you know, I really like the Pete Anderson tone that Dwight Yoakam's guitar player gets, or, you know, I really like the, the rockabilly type sound. Can you do that? And knowing how to dial those sounds in, in your space, in a good professional way and send them a good product efficiently, that takes time and practice. And if it's not where you are right now, I would say, you know, spend a little bit of time with backing tracks and spend a little bit of time just kind of learning your gear a little bit better and practice getting different sounds. That being said, let's jump to the next section where I'm gonna talk about the gear that I use. Um, I know I already covered this a little bit in the previous section, but the next section is really what you don't need, if anything. All right, so this last little bit of the video here, this section is about the gear that I use for the remote session work that I do. Now, there's a couple things that need to be said right at the very top, which is first, you don't need to spend uh, the kind of money that I spent on the recording gear that I have. You don't need to buy the same stuff. I'm not recommending that you buy the same stuff. What I own is a byproduct of having spent a long time doing very specific things and then buying little bits of you know, gear here or there, making upgrades where I see fit and just sort of winding up with the setup that I have. Um, you know, I think making a video that is all about like doing, you know, remote re recording session work or just recording yourself and your guitar on a budget would be very, very cool. But um, I just wanted to say that right up front. I'm not sitting here saying you need all of this stuff to do remote session work because you don't. Um, that being said, uh, in terms of the in the box stuff, I, I use Cubase. That's the platform that I'm on, um, you know in terms of like people sending you files and everything you guys don't need to be on the same platform that's something that's really worth pointing out you know if one person's on pro tools another person's on on reaper and you're on cubase that's totally fine because they should be bouncing and exporting files that are you know wave or mp3 or some kind of format that you can drag and drop into your own daw so it's more so about finding whatever platform you are comfortable with that gives you a good workflow. Um, I also have a few plugins that I really like to use just to get really easy sounds. Um, you know, that's, I actually do like using Amplitube quite a bit. Um, I like using the uh, Two Notes Wall of Sound, which, you know, goes along with a piece of gear that I'll talk about in a bit, the, the Captor X. And um, I actually, have a couple presets in Easy Mix that I've um, kind of put together and tweaked um, that I really like. Uh, you know, so again, it's not about how much money you're spending. It's about getting sounds that work for you and that are easy and, and ready at your fingertips so that you can just get the job done. 
Um, with that, let's just kind of jump right into the, uh, the guitars and go from there. Okay, well, let's talk about tools for a second, your instruments. Um, you know, I want to make a couple points right off the bat. The first is that if you're doing session work, you should probably have a variety of tools at your disposal. However, you don't need this. You don't need a collection of guitars in the closet and on racks out here. What you need is a handful of instruments that are going to give you some of the more standard or common sounds and your sound on top of that for session work. Uh, that being said, I also want to highlight the fact that when I uh, am doing session work, a lot of the instruments that wind up on recordings are not my nicest, most expensive or vintage uh, guitars. They are utilitarian tools that get the job done really well and are, you know, dependable. So uh, in terms of acoustic guitars, uh, I've got an Eastman OM back here. This thing makes it onto a lot of recordings. It's um, you know, great for strumming and for fingerstyle stuff. And you know, if you follow my channel, you've probably seen this one. Likewise, I've got a, uh, another Eastman here that stays in either high strung or Nashville tuning. There is a, a slight difference between those two things if you look into that. And um, you know, this guitar, if, if I'm using this one for strumming stuff, especially for more modern country, this guitar is a lot of times a secondary um, sort of complement to that that I send along with the tracks if they want to use something like that. It's, it's pretty common in um, especially, you know, country music from the 80s, 90s on. Um, another very inexpensive or affordable uh, guitar that I use on a lot of recordings is this Dan Electro Baritone. Um, I bought it used four or five years ago at this point for about 180 bucks, something in that ballpark. And it makes it onto a lot of recordings. It sounds fantastic, it's super dependable, and it just gets the job done really well. Uh, in terms of, you know, guitars for country, uh, I have, uh, you know, a 6120 back here. Um, I've got a, an Eastman, um, you know, kind of same thing with that, with, with TV Jones pickups in there. Um, I've got a variety of guitars in the closet, but in terms of Telecasters for country music, actually the one that gets recorded the most right now is a parts caster that I put together. You know, I've got a, a 60s, a vintage 60s Tele back there. I've got one that used to belong to Vince Gill, but more and more I find myself reaching for the parts caster because it's a guitar that I am regularly manipulating in terms of pickups and hardware in order to achieve different sounds that, that I'm, you know, just sort of fiddling around with. And, um, you know, those instruments make it onto the recordings way more than the ones that are stuck in the closet or the ones that are out here just kind of collecting dust because I have a purchasing problem. <laughs> um, again, you don't need this. Um, what you need is a handful of dependable um, instruments that are going to make you marketable because you're getting good sounds out of them not because they, you know, are client bait because you've got an original 50s telly. That kind of stuff is helpful if you're trying to market yourself in a certain way, but in terms of actually getting sounds, figure out what actually makes the sound that you are looking for and that your client's looking for. Okay, so uh, kind of the same thing in this section, guys. You don't need this. If you're familiar with my YouTube channel, you've seen this background it's the one that I use the most my rack of amps over here again this is just a byproduct of being um, you know deep in the guitar gear trading community um, you know for basically my whole life having worked in a guitar store when I was a teenager all of that um, you don't need a bunch of vintage and boutique amps in order to do session work what you need is something reliable that you're very familiar with that you can get good sounds out of easily um, maybe something that's going to give you a variety of different sounds, you know, um, you don't need to go boutique, but this Tone King um, has two different channels. It has what they call a lead channel and a rhythm channel. The rhythm channel is very much like a deluxe reverb, and the lead channel is um, more of a brown face, almost martially sound um, when you start driving the mids. And uh, it sounds very, very good. It gets a, you know, wide range of different sounds out of it. And if I was strapped for cash and, and you know, I couldn't go boutique, I would look for something that could do 
um, you know, something like that with multiple features that I just am very familiar with. That's the key. Okay, let's talk about mics and your signal chain and sort of all of the gear that goes along with recording for a second. Um, the thing that you're gonna hear me say over and over is it's not how much money you spend on the gear or how you know rare or vintage or expensive the gear is, but just rather uh, how familiar you are with it and how able you are to get good sounds out of the gear that you have. Um, again, a lot of this stuff is just the result of me having done this for a while and upgraded specific things when I had a need to. Uh, before I dive into the gear itself, I do want to mention that when I first started recording myself in my teens, um, I purchased gear for things that I thought I wanted to do. Primarily, you know, I had a, an audio interface that had eight inputs across the front because I was positive I was going to record drums. And I, you know, I purchased gear for the things that I thought I wanted to record one day or, you know, in the eventuality of, of, of you know, finding success in certain areas. That wasn't really the right approach, at least for me. Um, I eventually kind of wised up and started purchasing the gear, you know, or, or, you know, selling the gear that I had and purchasing gear for the things that I was already doing for the things that were making me money, for the things that were um, helping me move forward. And a lot of that was centered around recording, you know, guitar, uh, electric guitars, uh, acoustic guitars, you know, variables of electric guitars. So that's like baritone and electric bass and that type of stuff. Um, that's what I invested in. Now, some of the gear also doubles as, you know, being good for recording vocals or that type of thing. But, you know, I no longer purchase gear for the idea that I might one day be in a situation where I need to use it. Um, that being said, I did recently upgrade the mics that I uh, have been using to record acoustic and electric, you know, uh, guitars, and I'm super happy with them. Uh, so just right off the bat, before the upgrades, I was primarily using this AKG um, condenser. It's a Perception 220 and a couple SM57s back here, you know, kind of the studio standbys, and uh, a blue, um, sort of one of the budget blue condenser mics that I don't have out right now. Uh, I did recently upgrade to a um, warm audio uh, WA251. Uh, this is a tube condenser. Um, it's still, I guess, what some people would consider budget. They're around like eight, $900. To me, that's not budget for a mic, but um, this thing sounds fantastic on acoustic guitars, especially. But it, you know, it's great you know for vocals, which I don't do very much. But you know, I, I love having this thing ready to go for acoustic guitars. And, and actually, speaking of that, one thing that I want to mention is you'll notice that it's on a, a, a boom stand that's mounted to the desk. Um, I know that type of thing isn't necessarily super exciting to talk about, you know, the, the, the mic stands or the booms or that kind of thing, but it is something worth mentioning that, you know, if you're recording yourself, again, you're your own engineer, and, uh, you know, so there's not someone sitting off in a booth somewhere hitting record and asking if you're ready or anything like that. So anything you can do to make your workflow better, smoother, easier, that's really um, you know worth the investment, even if it's something boring like a boom stand. You know, having this sort of ready to go off to the side where I can just sort of whip it around and start recording acoustic guitars within a couple minutes, that makes things so much better in terms of my recording workflow. Um, the other mic that I'll mention here is I recently got a, a Royer R121 ribbon mic. Um, this thing is just absolutely wonderful for uh, recording the the vintage um, amps, you know, especially the the tweed stuff back there from the 50s, um, and I I pick those out in particular because uh, after I got my first um, you know load box and and impulse response um, you know unit this two notes captor X over here, I kind of stopped miking you know my more modern amps, the ones that have the the um, you know speaker outputs because. This thing really changed my workflow. Um, I'm able to just record any time of day now um, without, you know, setting up mics. And, and again, I'm in a little spare bedroom in the townhouse, so, you know, it doesn't sound great to begin with. I've got neighbors and all of that. Having this at my disposal 
was a game changer. So investing in something like that for yourself, especially if you're in less than optimum um, or less than optimal uh, recording settings, it's great. Um, I also recently invested in a 500 series uh, rack. Again, this is mainly for the mics. Um, I, do, I do like um, this Maris 440 as a DI for bass as well. But um, you know, this was sort of an investment that went along with the mic upgrade and uh, I'm super happy with it. I think I'm gonna make a separate video on that, but you know, just for now, uh, again, it's, it's not about how much you're spending on your gear. It's about just being familiar with the different you know, uses for your gear, really where it shines, right? Again, I pointed out this mic is good for this, this mic I use for this. And that way, you know, I'm not spending a ton of time swapping out mics and, and testing different sounds, but just getting to work with the things that I know work. That's the biggest thing when it comes to doing this um, professionally is being able to just know what works and what works for you and being able to just get right down to getting the sounds as opposed to spending your time um, you know, fiddling with stuff, setting things up, tearing things down. Uh, you're gonna spend countless hours doing that when you're first learning your gear, but eventually you need to get to the point where you've got a workflow where you can just be the professional that you're being hired to be. All right, so we're basically at the end of the video here. Uh, I just wanna take a minute to say thank you. If you made it this far, I know that this was a super long video. I know that there was a ton of talking and not much guitar playing, but I hope that if remote recording or you know recording sessions or session work is something that is interesting to you, I hope that you found this helpful. I hope that you walked away with just even a little nugget of information to help you get started or to help you continue to get better at, at you know being a session player or doing remote work. I do wanna say that if you enjoyed this video, then I would highly suggest, um, there's a DVD that Brent Mason did a few years ago where it's basically just him in a recording studio talking through, playing different parts and explaining what he does and why he does it. Uh, I'm gonna try to put the uh, front of the video up here. I'm not even sure if it's for sale anymore, but if it is, that is the watch, it, that's watching the master work, guys. That is so much information packed into that little DVD and it's inspiring to anybody who's interested in doing this. So I would highly suggest you check that out. Other than that, I just wanna say thank you all again. And if you have any questions, if you feel like there's something that I didn't cover that I should have, or if you feel like there's something I could have explained better and you have questions, please leave a comment down below and ask it. I'm more than happy to talk about this. I try to stay active in the comment sections of my videos. And um, with that, thank you all so much. And um, until next time.